Uh, first speaker is Surjit Rajendran. Surjit actually, right now he's from Johns Hopkins, but I call him a California kid from Caltech, Stanford, Berkeley. He and I, we, he worked very closely with me to help us launch the quantum initiative in the US through DOE. So uh, you will learn a lot about what we are doing there and what new ideas there could be. And this will be followed by four specially handpicked speakers this afternoon, including um, one from UK, that is Oliver on atomic interferometry. And then there are there's Bivor Singh from Bangalore itself on cavity qubit, Vijay from TIFR, and Apurva from Bangalore also. So with that, uh, um, go ahead, Sujit. Yeah. Okay, you talk. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a lot of fun to be here. And today I'm going to talk about fundamental physics with quantum sensors. Now, given the overall goals of this meeting, I thought what I'll do is actually give you guys a bird's eye view of all the interesting science that could be done with quantum sensing for, for fundamental physics. So I'll talk about many experiments, but I won't have uh, time obviously to go in detail in any of them, but I'll roughly tell you why these experiments should work or what the excitement is anyway. And if you have questions about anything specific, uh, please feel free to talk to me after the talk and I'm happy to answer your questions. So here is the issue, right? Um, we have a grand challenge in high energy physics today, which is that the standard model has been experimentally established. This took about a century of work, beginning uh, and largely done through colliders, beginning with the work of uh, Lawrence and company in the 1930s, going all the way to CERN, uh, you know, with the, Higgs, the discovery of the Higgs boson. And the standard model, every time we have asked a direct question about the standard model, it has said it's correct. There's no known experiment that actually directly violates the standard model. But we know there is new physics out there. This is not philosophy. Uh, there's more matter in the universe than antimatter. That's an observational fact. There's something called dark matter, also an observational fact. Both of these don't sit inside the standard model. So there's very clear reasons to think there is physics beyond the standard model. This is observationally true. Beyond that, we also have theoretical puzzles, such as the value of the dark energy, the cosmological constant, the hierarchy problem. Uh, both of these are serious theoretical issues for which we don't really have any good answers. And uh, more globally, we also know that if we take the laws of the universe and uh, you know uh, run the clock back in time, there comes a point where that doesn't work anymore. This is a so-called Big Bang. Uh, so there's certainly facts about the universe we don't obviously understand. So given that there is no doubt that there is new physics, the question becomes, where is this new physics? Why have we not found it? So as a theorist, I would say this is actually a... Uh, question about the new physics, what is its mass and what is its strength? So the mass, we know what we mean by that. The strength, I basically ask with what strength does this new physics interact with our standard model, protons, electrons, and neutrons, things of this kind. So in this two-dimensional plot, colliders have largely gone horizontally. They've gone of collisions to overcome your statistical issues. And a collider just comes with some luminosity. So it's not really that easy to go deep down in coupling if you want to find particles out there. But there is, I would say, considerable reasons to go and probe particles that are very, very weakly coupled. So examples of this include gravitational waves. We know they exist. We have discovered them, in fact. They are extremely weak, weakly coupled particles. And then there are also things called dark matter and dark energy, and we call them dark precisely because their interaction strength, the standard model, can be extremely small. So given that there's a very strong physics case, in my opinion, to go and search these incredibly weakly coupled particles, the question really becomes, how are we technologically going to do this? And what is the challenge? The challenge is, if you're trying to find these incredibly weakly coupled particles, you're often thinking about detecting extremely small, weak effects. You may have to measure time to the accuracy of 10 to the minus 23 seconds, measure magnetic fields as small as 10 to the minus 20 Tesla. And the question is, how do you do that? Now, very naively, that might seem like a job for an engineering school, right? Go and build some extremely precise instrument. But actually speaking, when you're thinking about measuring something to this level of accuracy, this is really a question of physics at the end of the day. So let's ask this simple question. How can we measure time to an accuracy of 10 to the minus 23 seconds? Well, uh, could we ask an engineer to go and build it, right? Now, an engineer, maybe someone in Switzerland, might work extremely hard to come up with a really, really nice clock. Great. So this guy worked very hard to come up with this very, very good clock, but 
no matter how hard this guy works, you know that because this is a macroscopic object, over time, because of things like friction, it will degrade. His ability to keep time will change. Not only that, let's say this guy makes his clock very, very carefully on day one, and on day two, he makes the next clock. How do we compare the clock that he makes on day one to the clock he makes on day two? Because you know that at some microscopic level, there will be some difference between one clock and the other. The gear on one clock will be somewhat different than the gear on the other clock. And so indeed, you really can't compare these two clocks. So with anything macroscopic, no matter how good an engineer you are, you're not gonna get accuracy of this kind. And that's where you wanna use quantum mechanics, a fundamental law of nature. And what you really wanna make use of is this incredible fact. There are 10 to the 80 hydrogen atoms in the universe. And no matter where you get this hydrogen atom from, it's exactly identical to every other hydrogen atom. So if I gave you a hydrogen atom and someone else in the Andromeda galaxy gave you another hydrogen atom, you can't tell them apart. They're exactly identical. Quantum mechanics forces this on you. Not only are they exactly identical, it's also the case that hydrogen atoms don't degrade due to friction, right? I have a hydrogen atom today. It has some energy structures. Tomorrow, it'll have exactly the same energy structures, guaranteed to you by the laws of physics. So the whole idea of quantum sensing is basically how can we leverage the properties of quantum mechanics fundamentally to create incredibly precise sensing platforms, right? You can see how the story works very sensibly. And so an example of this is the atomic clock where you're basically using atomic energy levels as oscillators effectively to keep track of time. But you can similarly do this for magnetic fields, accelerometers, all kinds of things. So this is a field that is not new. I mean, people have been building these things over the last two decades or so, and there have been very, very impressive developments in this field. So today, one can actually measure magnetic fields smaller than about a femtotesla or so through squid and atomic magnetometers, accelerations as small as 10 to the minus 13 times the acceleration due to gravity due to atom and optical interferometers, right? And this is a key point. Today, right, we have a lot of hype about quantum technology, blah, blah. Now, the stuff that I'm talking about is not some pie-in-the-sky stuff that doesn't exist. These machines exist. People can go and get them in the lab. Right? So it's very interesting to ask how one could actually use existing technology and use that, leverage that to actually go after new physics. And what's even more exciting is that if you talk to people who actually work in these areas, these are not mature fields in any way. They're not saturated. Right? Uh, there is every possibility that there's rapid technological advancements. And in fact, since I've been involved in this, these numbers have changed by two to three orders of magnitude every like decade or something like that. Right? So there's a lot of active areas going on pushing this technology forward. So it's interesting to ask, how can we actually use this technology to say, go after gravitational waves, probe the dark sector, things of this kind. And much more recently, my interests have also drifted towards asking, well, given that we're actually using these very, very precise quantum sensors, uh, leveraging quantum mechanics to make all these discoveries, uh, could we use these to test quantum mechanics itself fundamentally? So that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about very briefly today. I'll start by discussing how one can go after certain kinds of gravitational waves. Then we'll talk about how to detect certain kinds of dark matter. And then I'll briefly talk about trying to test certain modifications of quantum mechanics. And then I'll conclude. Gravitational waves. Well, the discovery of gravitational waves is one of the most historic things that humanity has ever done. 10,000 years from now, nobody will remember all the stupid politics that we lived through. People will remember the fact that we discovered gravitational waves. It's just simply true, right? Gravitational waves have given us a totally new way to look at the universe. It's equivalent to what Galileo did in the 16th century or whatever. And just like in electromagnetism, where pretty much in every frequency band that we have looked into, we have found interesting new things. Whether this is radio waves or gamma rays, X-rays, wherever it is, the universe has always surprised us with what's actually out there. So it's very reasonable that gravitational waves will do something similar, that you might find new things out there in the universe that don't emit light, but are nevertheless copious emitters of gravitational waves because nothing can hide from gravity. So this may actually allow us to discover totally new things that nobody's ever thought about simply because gravity is universal. Not only could there be things that nobody's ever thought about, we actually know of things that exist and produce lots of gravitational waves, such as mergers of black holes, white dwarfs, super, uh, and neutron stars. All of these are obviously of great excitement to astrophysicists generally. And very importantly, if you ever had ambition to go and discover the physics of the Big Bang, right? You have to look at the very, very early universe. And to look at the very, very early universe, you have to go behind the era of recombination from which we get photons. And the only known 
uh, messenger that can go to the very beginning of time pretty much as gravitational waves. So there's obviously a very, very strong physics case to look at the gravitational wave spectrum wherever we can. The LIGO experiment detects gravitational waves from about 10 hertz to about a kilohertz. And there's now an interesting scientific question, how do we probe other frequency bands other than LIGO? So how do you detect a gravitational wave? This is the general cartoon big picture idea, okay? Different experiments are gonna realize this big cartoon idea in different ways, but this is kind of what you need to do. A gravitational wave causes the distance between two objects to fluctuate, right? That's what it does. So how do you detect it? So let's say I have a very nice clock, A, and I have another clock, B, and let me separate them by some distance L. Now, at clock A, what I'm gonna do is every T seconds, T, two, T, three, T, I'm gonna send light pulses from A to B, okay? And at B, I'm gonna sit out there and record the time of arrival of these pulses. So if nothing is going on, the distance between A and B remains a constant. So even though I pulse the light T, 2T, and 3T, I'll receive the light at B at time T plus L, 2T plus L, 3T plus L. And so the time of arrival, since the distance hasn't changed, the, dist you know, the separation is still T seconds, right? So like nothing has happened. But now say a gravitational wave goes by. A gravitational wave will cause the distance between these two objects to fluctuate. And when that happens, even though I'm sending the light from here at T, 2T and 3T, the time of arrival will happen at T plus L plus epsilon, 2T plus L minus epsilon, so on and so forth. So if you simply sit there and measure the modulation of this arrival time, you can detect a gravitational wave. The reason why this is hard, of course, is because the effects of gravitational waves are extremely weak. So the time changes are extremely small. And so you need extremely precise technology to measure that very small length change. And just as importantly, you wanna make sure that the distance between these two clocks does not change by any other noise source, right? So the gravitational wave creates an extremely tiny effect. If someone else came there and moved the watch back and forth, obviously you will see the noise and not the actual signal. So to, do, to detect gravitational waves, you've got, you need two things. You need extremely precise technology to measure this very, very small length change and you also have to overcome all the systematics associated with making sure that the distance between these two objects only changes due to gravitational waves. So how does LIGO tackle this problem? What LIGO does is that they have an optical interferometer where they basically have two mirrors, all right? And they send light from a laser. It goes around two different arms. The light bounces between the mirrors and, uh, you know, and comes back and reinterferes. So it's effectively measuring the distance between the two mirrors. So the optical interferometer is an incredibly precise way to measure the distance. But very importantly, the mirrors of LIGO are held from a ceiling. And uh, when the world shakes, the ceiling will shake and the mirrors will also vibrate. So uh, to prevent that from being a problem, LIGO has to create the world's best vibration isolation system. And they did that, which is why they detected gravitational waves. But there's so much seismic activity at frequencies below 10 Hertz that despite LIGO's wonderful technology, you really can't see gravitational waves below 10 Hertz terrestrially. So I would like to think about how one might try to overcome this problem in a different kind of terrestrial detector. So here is the idea. So let's create the world's best vibration isolation system, all right? Let's take a, two, the two mirrors of LIGO and let's drop them, okay? So they're in free fall. As in free fall, let me try to measure the distance between them. Now, when a gravitational wave goes by, the distance between the mirror will still change, so you will be able to see the gravitational wave. Meanwhile, since the mirrors are in free fall, when the world shakes, there's no direct coupling between the shaking earth and the mirror. So you have basically created the world's best vibration isolation system. Now this is of course a brilliant idea, but this is a theorist idea because nobody will let you do that, right? The mirrors of LIGO are 40 kilograms of sapphire. And so nobody's gonna let you go and drop them. So the question becomes, instead of dropping the mirrors of LIGO, is it possible for us to drop something cheap, okay? Yet something very precise. And the answer is you can, you can drop atoms, cold atoms or, at, or atomic clocks because that's what an atomic clock is. It's just clocks, atoms falling down. So let me rapidly tell you what the idea of this Bages experiment actually is. Um, you know, so this is the rough idea of what we wanna do, right? Let's say you take, go to one of the, these mines in the world and you go and find one of these kilometer long vertical mine shafts that are there. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go to the top and the bottom of this mine shaft and you will drop a bunch of ultra cold atoms from the top and the bottom. So they're now in free fall. As they're in free fall, you use atom interferometry techniques 
to measure the distance between them, really the relative acceleration between these atoms and these atoms. So effectively, all you're really doing is think of these atoms as the mirrors of LIGO, and they're falling, and you're measuring the relative acceleration as they're in free fall. Okay? I don't have time to tell you how the atom interferometer actually works, but if you're interested, I'm happy to uh, tell you the full details. So uh, that's the main idea. And you know, uh, thanks to, in large part, to Swapin's effort, uh, he managed to persuade Fermilab to actually want to look at some of these effects. Uh, so Fermilab is actually building a 100 meter scale apparatus to test and prove some of these uh, you know, uh, concepts. And there are also many other groups around the world, Aeon in particular, that are also trying to do something similar in the UK. So let's switch gears and go from 10 Hertz, one to 10 Hertz on the earth. That's what we are, we are aiming for with Magus to something more ambitious for much lower frequencies. So there is a very nice idea on how to do gravitational waves at millihertz, and that is the LISA experiment, which I'm sure you've heard of. How does LISA work? The way LISA works is basically that they take three satellites, and inside each satellite, there's a little thing called a proof mass. And what LISA wants to do is measure the distance between these proof masses very, very accurately. So a gravitational wave goes by, the distance between the proof mass will fluctuate, and that is basically what they want to measure. Why is this challenging? Well, you're in space, so you might think naively there is no vibration problem, but that's not quite true because you're, you have a satellite around you. There is all kinds of stuff hitting the satellite, right? There's solar intensity fluctuations, charged particles going, doing things, all kinds of stuff, outgassing from the satellite, et cetera, which basically causes the satellites themselves to wiggle randomly. And when the satellite wiggles randomly, the random fluctuation of the satellite will gravitationally act on the proof mass and cause it to move as well. So if that movement is bigger than the gravitational waves, you can't detect gravity waves. So Lisa basically had to fly and prove what is called drag-free motion, where basically these three proof masses that are inside these satellites can only move due to gravity and nothing else. All right, And that's called flying this drag-free. That's a technical term for it. It's extremely hard. And they had to fly a special mission called the Lisa Pathfinder to prove that they could actually do it at the frequency of interest. So Lisa Pathfinder worked very well, and they demonstrated that at millihertz, it would basically, uh, uh, is at the performance level that Lisa required. But an interesting question, what if you wanted to go to lower frequency? After all, there are gravitational waves everywhere. Now, the Lisa Pathfinder showed that at Lisa frequencies, they could do what they wanted. But if you ask how good are they at lower frequencies, they're not very good. Of course, they're not trying very hard to be very good, uh, but at lower frequencies, the noise floor that they are in is considerably higher than what you would need to see gravitational waves. The question is, can we do something with atom interferometers and stuff like that in space now to go after much lower frequency gravitational waves, specifically at microhertz frequencies? So two things help you out as you go to lower frequencies. First of all, it turns out that the intrinsic strain of the gravitational waves you're trying to measure are about 10 to the minus 17 or 10 to the minus 18, which is about six orders of magnitude larger than the strains that you're looking at a LIGO. LIGO is like 10 to the minus 23. And that's fundamentally because at low frequencies, you're looking at mergers of extremely large black holes. These are just very, very violent events. So they give rise to much larger amplitudes and strain. Secondly, you can also separate, since you're in space now, separate two objects by something like one AU, as opposed to effectively the arm length of LIGO, which is about 1,000 kilometers. So essentially, if you want to detect gravitational waves of strain about 10 to the minus 17 or 10 to the minus 18, you need two objects in space, and you want the distance between them to be constant to about 0.1 microns. Okay, it's orders of magnitude larger than what LIGO is trying to get to. LIGO is 10 to the minus 18 meters. Right, this is 0.1 microns, considerably bigger. The challenge, though, is that you're at such low frequency that you still have to ensure that the two things don't move by more than 0.1 microns in, say, 10 to the six seconds. Right? How do you do that? So, of course, one could try to fly a LISA-like mission, but then you would require technology development to you know, make sure that uh, you attain your performance goal at these low frequencies. So it's interesting to ask if there's something else one could do. Now, I'm going to do the dumb thing, right? I have a force, random forces acting on an, ob on an object, and I don't want the random force to cause a large position displacement. The dumbest way to do that is to put a very, very large mass, because A is F over M. But of course, I can't launch anything much bigger than a one ton. That's already very expensive. So what can I use? Well, maybe I can try to use natural objects. So the position of the sun, oh, sorry, so the, the position of the planet Earth or Mars, things of this kind, right? 
So planets have extremely stable centers of mass. They don't move that easily. But even though a planet has very stable center of mass, its surface is what we have access to. And the surface of a planet is very noisy. The Earth has seismic activity. That's why we can't do most of these things on the Earth. Plus, there is all kinds of atmospheric effects, things of that kind, that also cause all kinds of waves. So what we really want is an object that is big enough that its center of mass is sufficiently stable. At the same time, it's small enough that it doesn't have internal dynamics, right? It's lost its heat of formation. There isn't weather, things of this kind. Luckily, we have such objects around us. They're called asteroids, 10 kilometer asteroids. Here's an idea. Suppose we look at two 10 kilometer asteroids, a few kilometer asteroid, and let me land two crafts on them, okay? And I'm gonna put an atomic clock here, an atomic clock here, and I'm gonna have a little radio station or a laser station that sends laser beams from one asteroid to the other. And I'm gonna do exactly the same experiment. I'm gonna use this clock, send light every T seconds, and I'm gonna sit out there and receive light every, and see when it's arriving. The gravitational wave comes by, the distance changes, and the time of arrival will modulate. I can do that. So is this possible? How much of this is science fiction? So first of all, can we land on asteroids? Bruce Willis showed this was possible in the 1990s. Okay, that just dates me. Uh, but in fact, for the last 20 years or so, humanity has been sending robotic craft to asteroids. Both NASA and the Japanese Space Agency have periodically gone to a variety of asteroids, landed on them, and done a bunch of stuff. Turns out for technical reasons that landing on an asteroid is actually considerably easier than going to another planet. Because let's say you want to go to Mars, you boost yourself to get off the Earth, and when you go to Mars, Mars has a pretty big self-gravity, so you need to go there and slow down. So anytime you watch one of these Mars landing videos, they have the last you know, 10 minutes of terror or whatever it is where all kinds of bad things could happen. But on an asteroid, since there is not much of a self-gravity, you can launch yourself so that when you get to the asteroid, the relative velocity between you and the asteroid becomes low enough that you just very, very gently land on it. Okay, so this has been done, demonstrated technology. Secondly, I require atomic clocks that are stable to one part in 10 to the 17 to one part in 10 to the 18 over this very long, uh, this low frequency of about a microhertz. Those actually exist. If you go to Jun Yi at NIST, he's got these clocks and they're not space qualified, but there's a lot of interest in creating a space qualified clock. And so, you know, that part of the story also makes sense. So the next question, which is the actual scientific question is, how sure are we that the asteroid surface and center of mass are stable enough, okay? Now it turns out that nobody's actually measured seismic activity in situ on an asteroid. They, they, they don't do it because they think it doesn't exist. So what we actually did was we went through the data for, for uh, seismometers that have been placed both on the moon and on Mars and stuff like that. And from those actual measurements, it appears that there's a very reasonable reason to think that the surface of the asteroid would be stable to let's say 0.1 microns over 10 to the six seconds. Okay, so what we are trying to do now is try to get one of these asteroid guys to take a little seismometer with them the next time they go visit one of these asteroids, put it in there and make a measurement. And if in fact they find that the seismic activity on an asteroid is less than 0.1 microns or so, there would be, I think, a very strong scientific case to just put a, an atomic clock and a laser station out there and then detect gravitational waves at a microhertz. Yes, yes. I'll be quick with the rest of the stuff. So I'll very rapidly tell you what we can do with dark matter. So here's the fact about dark matter. We know dark matter exists. Other than that, we know very little about it. We know that it's, it can't have a mass lower than about 10 to the minus 22 EV or 10 to the minus 55 grams. That's what a bosonic particle. For a fermion, the mass can't be less than 10 to the minus 31 grams or 100 EV or so. And it can't be heavier than 10 to the 24 grams. That's all we know. 80 orders of magnitude in parameter space. So anything beyond this is a guess. And we have looked for whip dark matter for many, many years. It's a great thing to do, but we haven't found anything yet. So the question is, in my opinion, we should really go after this full parameter space. No theorist in the world can tell you exactly what it is. All right. So how do we systematically think about probing a large part of this parameter space in some reasonable way? So if you're thinking about detecting dark matter that is this light, okay, very low mass, it's very hard to find that through energy deposition because the amount of energy you deposit in any, every collision will be very, very small. What can you leverage? What you can leverage is that you know the total amount of energy density there is, and that is simply equal to the mass of the dark matter times the number density. So the mass is small, the number density would be very, very high. So you're thinking about dark matter this light, 
you don't think about it as individual particles. You think about it as like a wave. It's a huge number of particles sitting in the same mode. And they're oscillating up and down at a frequency equal to the dark matter mass. So how do you detect this kind of wave? Okay, let's ignore the theory. Let's be practical experimentalists. To detect a wave, I have to ask, how does this wave influence particles that I control? Photons, electrons, protons, and neutrons. So how does a wave, a dark matter wave, affect these particles? Well, there's nothing specific about dark matter. I can just ask, how do waves affect these particles? And this is what waves can do. So say there's a dark matter wave, it's oscillating up and down at a frequency equal to its mass. It can drive a current in a circuit, push on electrons. It can cause some spins to rotate. It can exert forces on objects. And it can change the value of fundamental constants. That's it. Those are the experimental effects it's going to have. Now, if it drives a little current in a circuit, that will create a small magnetic field. If it causes a spin to rotate back and forth, that will also change the magnetization of a material. So you can stick a little magnetometer next to it, and that will try to see that effect. The dark matter exerts a force directly on objects that will cause an acceleration. If the dark matter changes the values of fundamental constants, even if you take two objects and the distance between them is not actually changing, when the fundamental constants change, the ruler that you're using to measure that distance, which is like the laser light frequency, will fluctuate. So it'll look like these objects are actually moving. So you can detect that with optical and atom interferometry. Right? So this actually allows you, it turns out, to systematically probe a large part of this low mass dark matter parameter space that was previously not possible. So in the last five minutes, let me tell you about quantum mechanics and how one can try to modify it and test it. First of all, why? Think about it. Quantum mechanics was a theory that a bunch of people got together in a conference in the 1900s and said, these are the rules, right? Now, why should it be that people in a conference get to decide the rules forever? Why should it be the absolute truth? There's, of course, a sociological problem in physics, which is that when you tell people you're trying to modify quantum mechanics, they'll say the two things. Are you close to retirement? Are you crazy? As you can tell, I'm not close to retirement, okay? So, but why does the sociology exist? And that's really because of the following thing. What aspects of quantum mechanics can you really change, right? All of quantum mechanics fundamentally rests on two postulates, probability and linearity. Probability is a fundamental part, about, part about, the, about nature. And many people have tried to modify quantum mechanics by trying to go after probability. But that's too hard. It's too much of a fact. And so it's not a big surprise to me that all of those efforts fail. Right? And probability is what makes people most uncomfortable with quantum mechanics. So it's natural why they went after it. But I'm going to take a different point of view. I'm perfectly happy with the probabilistic world. All right. So given that probability is a fundamental part about the world, is it possible to change linear time evolution? Okay. Why should the Schrodinger equation be linear? Surprisingly, not very many people have pursued this line of inquiry. Weinberg tried to do it. And let's see what issue he ran into. So let's do something very dumb. Take the Schrodinger equation, i d psi dt is h psi. And let me add a nonlinear term, right? Epsilon psi square, psi star square times psi. At a single particle level, there's no problem. You can go solve this and you know, perturbatively, you know how to do it, no big deal. What is the issue? The issue is that quantum mechanics has to describe more than one particle. And entanglement is a fundamental aspect of multi-particle quantum systems. So let's look at Weinberg's term and try the following. Let's say I give you an electron or something on the Earth, and I give you, and it's entangled with another electron, let's say in Mars, all right? And I create this complicated entangled state, and I substitute this complicated entangled state in this equation, and I'm going to solve it to see how it's supposed to evolve. Now let's perform the following thought experiment. I will take the electron that I have on the Earth and apply some local operation on it, okay? So I apply some unitary rotation on it. When I apply some unitary rotation on it, the coefficients sitting up here will all change. But when I have a psi square and a psi star square, if you go to the algebra, what you will find is that when I change these coefficients on the Earth, it will instantly change how the particle in Mars is responding. Because I've changed the Hamiltonian in Mars the moment I did something on the Earth. And this was pointed out by Joe Polshinsky. So of course, since Weinberg failed, people were like, ah, of course, linearity and quantum mechanics must somehow come from causality. But the funny thing is that if you look at Polshinsky's paper, after he pointed this out, the next part of Polchinski's paper is really about how there could be causal nonlinearities in quantum mechanics. And somehow nobody thought that through, including Joe. He didn't pursue it. So my own flirtation with this began with this following question. 
And this is just the main idea, okay? Let's just think about linear quantum mechanics. And let's think about how an electron that is coupled to electromagnetism is supposed to go from A to B. Well, it's supposed to follow the path integral. It takes all possible paths to go from A to B. And the key thing about linear quantum mechanics is that even though this electron is coupled to electromagnetism, these paths don't pull on each other, okay? But if I put a second electron, and that electron also takes all of its paths to go from A to B, then even though the paths of each electron don't see themselves, this electron has no problem pulling on this guy, right? That's just true. But if you think about it, isn't that bizarre? These paths could literally be on top of each other. So if you're bang in the middle of this path, how do you even know where this line came from? Why should causality all of a sudden show up and say, look, I can talk to my neighbor, but I can't talk to myself, right? And if you think about this more, you realize that actually the way we put in causal interacting theories in quantum mechanics is not through single particle quantum mechanics, it's really through quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is a natural language to describe causal theories, interacting theories. So what we did in my paper with David Kaplan is we took a slightly different approach. Usually we think of quantum mechanics as an uber structure and quantum field theory as deriving it from it. What we said instead was like, no, I'm a quantum field theorist. Quantum field theory is fundamental. So let me try to put nonlinearities directly into quantum field theory. Turns out you can do that. Okay, you can go look at our paper and uh, you can preserve all the things you want to preserve, unitarity, conservation of norm, uh, maintain gauge invariance, all kinds of stuff. So as far as we can tell, this theory doesn't seem obviously wrong, right? Like there could be experimental reasons why it's not true, but that's exactly why we want to test it. So the one test that we have done is a very classic kind of test. You take an ion, you split the ion into two paths, okay? Half the ion, let's say, is here, the other half is there. And in linear quantum mechanics, these two arms do not talk to each other with the Coulomb interaction, but now in the nonlinear world, they will. Okay, there will basically be a phase shift in this experiment that depends upon the intensity of how, how much of the ion was in this side versus this ion. In the first round of the experiment that was done in the last year, we didn't find the result. Okay, but we're going to try to do a much more sensitive experiment. So with that, let me conclude. And sorry for going a little bit over time. In the last century, we understood the standard model. And this was due to a, a hard work of an enormous community of people. And it really began because of a dramatic evolution in collider technology in the 20th century. This is a fact about the world. Why did this happen? The reason why this happened is because in the 20th century, humanity mastered electromagnetism, right? Uh, Maxwell wrote down the laws in 1867. Hertz discovered electromagnetic waves in 1887 or whatever. And then it took 30, 40 years for people like Lawrence to go and really understand how to come up with really good electromagnetic systems. And then we've done a lot of wonderful work in dramatically scaling up their power over the last 100 years. And we've learned a lot about the world in the last 100 years because of this. In my opinion, we are on a very similar level with quantum technology. We discovered quantum mechanics 100 years ago, but it's just now in the last few years that we are really at the anvil of quantum control, where we are actually able to control single quantum systems, manipulate them in ways that we really want to be able to do. Okay, so I would say we're kind of roughly at this Lawrence style level of being able to play with this technology and see what it does. So in my opinion, this is actually the right time in human history for us to go and make a concerted effort to try to find this weekly couple physics, right? Because after all, if you think about the plot of new physics, you know, you got to ask yourself, the colliders did a lot of things and they went horizontally, right? Higher and higher energy. Now you got to ask yourself the following question. Is are these discoveries simply because all the goodies, all the new physics is only along one direction? Or is it because that was the only direction that our technology was good enough to take us, right? I would bet that probably there's physics everywhere and therefore we should try to look more broadly than we've been looking. Thank you. Well, thank you, speaker. Thank you, Sujit, for the exciting talk. I will entertain only two questions, okay? For this, okay? All right. Rajesh. <laughs> I'm glad you came, and I'll show you here. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I enjoyed your talk. Okay. Uh, um, I had a couple of questions, but they're short. Uh, uh, so when you said a dark matter wave uh, can change the fundamental constants, yeah. did you mean it's like a dielectric kind of a change or? A... Oh, I'm just saying it's like an alpha modulus or an electron modulus, right? So you just take the electron mass, 
put a field in front of it. And so the, the, when the thing oscillates up and down, the mass will fluctuate. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the uh, second question uh, is sort of a generic question about these asteroids. Yeah. Uh, um, why didn't you consider uh, the moon, which is also seismically not so active? Uh, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, so the moon is actually a plausible place to go to. Uh, the thing is, we would require two base stations. So one could be the moon in principle, but you would still require another thing somewhere else. Yeah. And we just felt that in terms of things like landing, etc., cetera, uh, asteroids may be easier. But you may be right that politically going to the moon may be a more <laughs> profitable enterprise. So, uh, uh, or Mars has Mars two moons. Well. Uh, yeah. Has two yeah. moons. Exactly. Maybe exactly. There's a, moon moon because moon. I was wondering, in the asteroids, isn't there a high probability of collision with other asteroids and yes, so on? Yes, yes. Uh, and so we're looking at essentially, I would say, inner solar system asteroids. So there are mostly collisions with small rocks. Now, specifically, the moons of Mars are not so good because they're close enough to Mars. There's actually okay. tidal strain that yes. causes tidal quakes. Thanks. Okay, another question from somebody. One more question, Maximo. Oh, there, 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 Vivek. Oh, sorry, right there. There's a question in the chat box. Chat, oh, but like, let me answer. Uh, this is about your uh, atom dropping down yeah. a, a shaft. Yeah. Now, wouldn't it be affected by micro changes in, you know, uh, so let's say water seeps through. Mm -hmm. That would change. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, you're detecting yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you're, you're absolutely right. Some small seismic activity that causes a slight rearrangement in the rocks. So we, the gravitational effects of that will be felt. Yes. And uh, those are indeed very important. Yeah. And they're expected to be very important at frequencies below one hertz. So which is why I said one to 10 hertz is basically where I think the atom technology will really be useful terrestrially. Okay. Uh, you know, you could probably go a little bit below one hertz, but that's very complicated question of the exact location, stuff like that. So we don't really exactly know that that answer that one. Thank you. Okay, that's it. I think there's a chat question. Uh, yeah. We, how can we see this? I can click this, this question here. in the chat box. Uh, in the presence of the solar wind, will the surface of the asteroid be stable enough? Yes, we check that because that'd be a good estimate, given given that we know how much uh, solar wind fluctuations are actually are. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, thank you. Thank you, Sujit. Thanks thank a you. lot to the speaker again. All right.